Welcome to section 8 of Reproductive Embryology. In this section, we'll be discussing the first and second pharyngeal arches. Let's get started. Before we dive into the image mnemonic, I'd like to briefly show you the table of information that we'll be memorizing over the next two videos. You can see that there are arches 1, 2, 3, 4, and 6 over on this left column right here. And you can also see that each arch has associated cartilages, muscles, nerves, and arteries. I'm not going to read this to you because we'll cover the information in the image mnemonic. However, it may be helpful as a quick reference and it provides a nice overview of information. All right, with this in mind, let's dive into the image mnemonic. This scene will take place at the Arches National Park, which is a pretty cool place in the state of Utah that has tons of natural sandstone arches. We can see those arches very prominently in the background of this image. On the left, we can see one big arch, which apparently is a nice location for a wedding. This singular arch on the left will represent the first pharyngeal arch. On the right side of the image, we can see two arches right next to each other. So the information near these two arches will represent the second pharyngeal arch. All right, now let's discuss the first pharyngeal arch first. This is a wedding scene, so there has to be music, right? Notice that we've shown this band member guy off to the left of the groom playing his trusty mandolin. The word mandolin sounds like mandible, which is here to help you remember the mandibular process and mandible. The mandibular process is a fetal structure that gives rise to many adult structures, which we'll talk about in the next few slides. Most obvious is the fact that the mandibular process gives rise to the mandible. The mandibular process also gives rise to a fetal structure known as Meckel's cartilage. To help you remember this, we've added a mechanical watch on this band member's wrist. The word mechanical sounds like Meckel and should help you think of Meckel's cartilage. Meckel's cartilage gives rise to the malleus and the incus. To help you remember the malleus, we've shown a mallet hanging off of this guy's tool belt. I guess he uses this mallet to repair his instruments. We've also shown him wearing a shirt with an Inca symbol on it. Inca sounds like Incus. So putting all these ideas together should help you remember that the mandibular process gives rise to Meckel's cartilage, which ultimately becomes the malleus and Incus. The last structure that the mandibular process gives rise to is the sphenomandibular ligament. To help you remember this, we've shown a sphinx cat next to the band member guy. So sphinx for sphenomandibular ligament. The other major cartilage derived from the first arch is the maxillary process. To help you remember this, we've shown another girl playing the xylophone with maxi pads. The word maxi in maxi pad sounds like maxillary process, which should help you remember this structure. The maxillary process gives rise to the maxilla and the zygomatic bone. So the maxi pad represents the maxillary process as well as the maxilla, and the xylophone represents the zygomatic bone. So putting all of these ideas together should help you remember that the maxillary process gives rise to the maxilla and zygomatic bone. Now we've added some licorice on the edge of the xylophone that is accidentally getting knocked over as she plays her instrument. Let's zoom up a bit so you can see this better. In this image, we decided to include red licorice because it looks kind of like a blood vessel. Again, the maxi pad represents the maxilla. So the maxi pad hitting the bag of red licorice should make you think of the maxillary artery. If we zoom back out, we can see another band member taking a little rest on the chair. She also has a mandolin on her back as well as three gems and a belt around her waist. The three gems should make you think of trigem, or the trigeminal nerve. And the fact that it's next to the mandolin should make you think of the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. So putting all these ideas together should help you remember that the first pharyngeal arch is associated with the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. All right, so far we've covered the cartilage, nerves, and arteries. Now let's move on to discuss the muscles of the first pharyngeal arch. Notice that we've added another band member and some dogs that belong to the bride and groom. If we zoom up on this, you can see that the dogs are enjoying a nice meal. The dog on the left is named Milo, as you can see by his name tag, and you can see him chewing pretty vigorously with some of his mastication muscles shown quite prominently. This reference to dogs eating and chewing should make you think of muscles of mastication. So the first arch gives rise to the muscles of mastication, such as the temporalis, masseter, and the lateral and medial pterygoids. We've also shown another band member playing the tympani, which should help you remember that the first arch also gives rise to the tensor tympani muscle. The fact that the dog's name is Milo should make you think of the mylohyoid muscle, which is another muscle associated with the first pharyngeal arch. Milo appears to have a doggy friend who's enjoying the food with him, and we can see his friend's tongue sticking out of his mouth. Notice that only the front part of the dog's tongue is visible, which should make you think of the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. So the first arch gives rise to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. If we zoom back out now, you can see that we've shown the bride attempting to walk towards the arch, but she appears to be running into some trouble. This little kid was trying to hold her veil up to prevent it from getting dirty, but he got distracted and pulled a bit too hard. I guess you could say that there's a lot of tension on this veil. Anyway, tension and veil should make you think of the tensor veli palatini, 
So the first arch also gives rise to the tensor veli palatini muscle. Now we've shown an oblivious hiker guy trying to destroy some ants. He doesn't seem to care too much that a wedding is in session. He's more interested in pouring gasoline inside of this ant hill. In any case, he has two cans of gas, one in each hand. This idea of two gas cans should make you think of dye gas. And the fact that he's pouring the gas on the ant hill should make you think of the word anterior. So putting these two ideas together should help you remember that the first arch gives rise to the anterior belly of the digastric muscle. All right, now that we've covered the first arch, let's move on to discuss the second arch. As you may have seen from the table on the previous slide, many of the muscles associated with facial expression are derived from the second pharyngeal arch. To help you remember this, we've shown a group of school kids on an educational tour making faces at the people having the wedding. I guess they don't approve of this wedding disrupting their environmental excursion to the Arches National Park. So kids making faces for muscles of facial expression. This should also help you remember the facial nerve, which is cranial nerve 7. You may have also noticed that one of the schoolboys has decided to tie up a hammock between the two arches and is resting away peacefully. You can see him back here. This hammock that's tied between two arches is here to help you think of the number 2 and reinforce the idea that the information on the right side of the image is regarding the second pharyngeal arch. Now we've added one of the park workers that's responsible for cleaning up the park. We can see him diligently raking away an attempt to make the area look nice and tidy. Anyway, the word rake should make you think of Reichert cartilage, which is an embryonic structure that gives rise to several structures that we'll discuss in a second. The first structure that is derived from Reichert's cartilage is the lesser horn of the hyoid. To help you remember this, we've shown a very small schoolboy playing the French horn and waving to the band as if saying hi to them. I guess he hopes to be like them one day, playing in a real band and all. His peers seem to think he's pretty ridiculous, so they're doing what school kids often do and are mocking him for his aspirations. In any case, the fact that this kid is so small should make you think of the word lesser, and the French horn should make you think of horn, so lesser horn. The fact that the boy is waving as if saying hi should make you think of the hyoid. So putting all these ideas together should help you remember that Reichert's cartilage gives rise to the lesser horn of the hyoid. All right, now we've shown several more students working on some projects around an outdoor table. Let's zoom up on them so you can see this better. First, notice that the kid in the middle is using a stapler. The word stapler sounds like stapes, which should help you remember that Reichert's cartilage gives rise to the stapes. It also should help you remember that the second pharyngeal arch gives rise to the stapedius muscle. We can also see a boy off to the right a bit using a stylus pen on an electronic device. The word stylus should make you think of the styloid process, which should help you remember that Reichert's cartilage gives rise to the styloid process. Finally, the kid off to the left is using a stylus pen and is also waving as if saying hi to some of the people at the wedding. The stylus pen should make you think of stylo, and the fact that he's saying hi should make you think of hyoid. So together, this kid should help you remember that Reichert's cartilage gives rise to the stylohyoid ligament. It's also here to help you remember that the second pharyngeal arch gives rise to the stylohyoid muscle. You may have noticed some red licorice right between the stapler and the kid saying hi, and this is to help you remember the stapedial artery and the hyoid artery. So the second pharyngeal arch gives rise to the stapedial and hyoid arteries. On the far right side of the image, we can see a very stuck-up kid who is sitting on the table and grimacing at the wedding. How dare they disrupt his peaceful outdoor time. To make him appear even more snobbish, we've shown him holding his pet platypus. Anyway, the word platypus sounds like platysma, which should help you remember that the second pharyngeal arch gives rise to the platysma muscle. If we zoom back out, we can see another worker guy pouring some gasoline on this post. I guess it's time for the post to go and install a new one, and he plans to remove the post by burning it down with all of his gasoline. Anyway, just like the guy with the gas off to the left, this guy is here to help you think of the digastric muscle. However, rather than an ant hill, the post should make you think of the posterior belly of the digastric muscle. So the second pharyngeal arch gives rise to the posterior belly of the digastric muscle. All right, now that we've covered all of the structures associated with the first and second pharyngeal arches, let's move on to discuss some disorders. So there are two disorders associated with abnormal development of the first and second pharyngeal arches, including Treacher-Collins syndrome and Pierre-Robin sequence. Let's discuss Treacher-Collins syndrome first. Remember, the information on the left is regarding the first pharyngeal arch, and the information on the right next to the two arches is regarding the second pharyngeal arch. Therefore, the information directly in the middle of the image is true of both the first and second pharyngeal arches. So in this image, we'll include both disorders in the center region of the image. All right, with this in mind, notice that we've added a teacher of all of these hooligans in the center of the image. As you can see, she's teaching them about dominoes and xylophones. Anyway, the teacher should make you think of treacher Collins syndrome. And like I just mentioned, she is in the middle of the image, so treacher Collins syndrome is caused by derangement of the first and second pharyngeal arches. 
She's teaching these kids about entertainment, and we can see her using a laser pointer to highlight some of the dominoes on her poster. We've used this symbol in some of our biochemistry videos, but for those of you who have not watched these yet, just know that the dominoes represent autosomal dominant diseases. Because dominoes sounds like dominant. So treacher Collins syndrome is an autosomal dominant disorder. The xylophone should make you think of zygomatic bone and help you remember that in this disorder, there is zygomatic bone hypoplasia. Also notice that we intentionally made the teacher standing on top of the crest of a little hill. This crest should make you think of neural crest, and help you remember that this disorder is associated with neural crest cell dysfunction. Now we've added this hippie band guy to the image. He was playing in the wedding band, and when he had a break, he stepped away to ask this music teacher for some advice on how to play his mandolin. You can see that after climbing up the hill, he's out of breath. And this should help you remember that treacher Collins syndrome is associated with airway compromise. The mandolin that he's holding is here to help you remember that this disorder is also associated with mandibular hypoplasia. Finally, notice that the teacher is holding her hand up to her ear as if she can't hear him very well. After all, he's out of breath, so I guess this makes sense, right? In any case, the reference to difficulty hearing should help you remember that this syndrome is associated with hearing loss. Here is a picture of a patient with treacher Collins syndrome, which highlights some of the characteristic facial features. So to summarize, treacher Collins syndrome is caused by derangement of the first and second pharyngeal arches. It's an autosomal dominant disorder associated with neural crest cell dysfunction and presents with facial abnormalities, such as mandibular and zygomatic bone hypoplasia, as well as airway compromise and hearing loss. All right, now let's move on to discuss Pierre Robin sequence. To help you remember this disorder, we've shown a bunch of robin birds in the middle of the image. Robin birds, Pierre Robin sequence. Again, just like with treacher Collins syndrome, We've shown this between the information representing the first pharyngeal arch and the second pharyngeal arch to help you remember that Pierre Robin sequence is caused by derangements of the first and second pharyngeal arches. Most birds, including robins, have pretty small beaks, which should make you think of a small face or jaw. So Pierre Robin sequence is associated with micronathia, or small jaw. Now we've added two more birds to the image. If we zoom up, we can see that they got a hold of some of the bride's lip gloss and are now trying to eat it. The word gloss should make you think of glossoptosis, which refers to downward displacement of the tongue. So Pierre Robin sequence is associated with glossoptosis. Also notice that we've shown the robins on a wooden palate that's a bit worn down from the harsh environment. Anyway, this broken down palate should make you think of a cleft palate. So Pierre Robin sequence is associated with cleft palate. Finally, notice that we've added one of the groomsmen over near the birds. He was innocently admiring the birds when he began to have an allergic reaction. I guess he's deathly allergic to robins, and now he can't breathe. Anyway, the fact that he's holding his throat as if he's having an allergic reaction should help you remember that Pierre Robin sequence is associated with airway obstruction. Here is a picture of a patient with Pierre Robin sequence, which highlights some of the characteristic facial features. So, to summarize, Pierre Robin sequence is caused by derangement of the first and second pharyngeal arches. It presents with micronathia, cleft palate, glossoptosis, and airway obstruction. Alright, that should be everything you need to know about the first and second pharyngeal arches.